Today on Straight Talk Africa, the 25th African Union Summit is over. We will discuss and analyze what the meeting accomplished, or whether, as observers say, it was more on style and less on substance. That's coming up next, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, June 17th. I am Shaka Sali. Well, hello to you, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariam Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about the significance of the recent African Union Summit held in Johannesburg. And coming up later in our SDA inbox, we'll share some thoughts from our audience who had a lot to say on the topic via emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, African leaders wrestled with several persistent issues at the summit, regional security and Africa's long-term development goals, pledging to fulfill Agenda 2063 plan with its official theme, marking the year of women's empowerment. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. The summit in Johannesburg opened as they all do, with hope and ceremony. South African President Jacob Zuma hosted the event. The 25th Ordinary Summit of the African Union provides us the specific opportunity to express our resolve on the challenges and opportunities Africa is experiencing. The official theme at the gathering of African leaders was the Year of Women's Empowerment and Development. Angelina Jolie was speaking in her capacity as Special Envoy to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. There is a global epidemic of violence against women, both within conflict zones and within societies at peace. You can make protecting and empowering women the priority that it has to be. Noted attendees at the summit included the Republic of Congo's president, Deni Sassou Ngeso, Nigeria's newly elected president, Muhammadu Buhari, and provoking international concern and controversy, Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir. Bashir is wanted by the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity in Darfur. U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. We have uh, supported the efforts of the ICC, uh, who have issued a warrant for arrest to, uh, uh, against President Bashir. And we have encouraged African countries and other countries who are signatories to the ICC to turn him over for prosecution. Those people who were the victims of genocide and others who have suffered in Sudan deserve the opportunity uh, to get justice. Despite a South African court order, Bashir was granted the same immunity all summit attendees received, and the Sudanese president attended several events unhindered. And he arrived back in Khartoum Monday to cheers of support. Other issues discussed at the summit, economic development, security concerns, and a worsening African refugee situation. The AU called for the postponement of Burundi's July 15th presidential election and negotiations between President Pierre Nkurunziza's government and opposition groups opposed to the third-term bid. Well, we are very, very concerned about the situation, the ongoing situation in Burundi. Our policy is clear. Uh, we do not support uh, presidents seeking uh, to extend their um, uh, period in office by changing the Constitution. For a democracy to thrive, we think there should be change of governments, transitions in governments on a regular basis. Robert Mugabe is serving his seventh term as president of Zimbabwe and has been in power there since 1980. And as this year's chairman of the African Union, he closed the summit, pledging the AU will defeat militant extremists by confronting terrorists collectively and pressing for dialogue to resolve interstate conflicts. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, now, joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests. Rosemary Seguero, 
founder and chief executive of Hope for Tomorrow, an international non-governmental organization founded in 2008. Its goal is to provide education and advocacy support for human rights, women's rights, and the prevention of conflict and violence. And Reverend Dr. Isaac Mwase, founding president of the Friends of Baptist in Zimbabwe, a non-profit organization founded in 2002. Its mission is to support Baptists and the disadvantaged among the people of Zimbabwe as they deal with the economic challenges. He previously served as a professor of bioethics and philosophy at Tuskegee University in the southern U.S. state of Alabama. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have to say I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is 1. But before we begin today's discussion, let's get an update on what transpired during the AU summit. And for that, I am joined by my colleague, Anita Powell, Voice of America's Southern Africa correspondent, who joins us via Skype from Johannesburg, the city of gold. Good evening, Anita. Hi, Shaka. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. I know that, of course, uh, you covered the summit and you have covered several other summits before. How would you compare and contrast the 25th uh, summit with the previous ones that you attended? That's a great question, Shaka. Now, I have to make the distinction that the summits that I covered before in Addis Ababa were before the Arab Spring. And what's essential about that point is I feel that the summits in, from 2007 to 2009 that I covered were extremely open compared to this one. There were a lot of issues at this summit that I feel were very sensitive. Uh, we're talking about Burundi. We're talking about the process in South Sudan. We're talking about the presence of Omar al-Bashir. And simply put, there were leaders who I've spoken to many times in the past at summits, one-on-one, -on -one, who were very forthcoming, who just were not at this summit. I think there's definitely been a closing of that space, and leaders were extremely reluctant to talk to the media. And we were, of course, the only, you know, impartial observers there. So by refusing to talk to the media, they were essentially refusing to talk to all of you who are watching. So what do you think uh, was the dynamic, was the reason? Uh, behind this particular summit, which you characterize as having actually been quote unquote closed, as compared to previous ones, which you say were more open? Well, there was a lot of tension. On the first official day when all the heads of state arrived, arrived the um, opening ceremony was delayed by five hours. And what we heard, the scuttlebutt that we heard in the corridor, was that all the heads of state were locked up on the fifth floor discussing what to do with Omar al Bashir. Um, and how to handle the fact that he was there. I think that was a really sensitive situation that they felt the need to discuss privately, and that led to this tension in the air. In fact, uh, Anita, there has been a lot of complaints from the African audience that uh, the Western media tended to focus on the issue of Sudanese President uh, Omar Bashir with the ICC as opposed, perhaps, in their view, to the more important issues which were discussed in Johannesburg. How do you react to that? Well, as I said, that really did dominate a lot of the workings of the summit. They were locked up upstairs talking about Omar al-Bashir. It was definitely a focus for the African leaders who were there. The, the few who did talk to us brought it up. Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma brought it up. Robert Mugabe brought it up. Um, and in South Africa, um, where we already have quite a tense political atmosphere, it was huge news. So I'm afraid it did hijack, uh, for lack of a better word, the proceedings of the summit. And also, to be fair, the other issues that they were talking about, Burundi, the crisis in South Sudan, women's empowerment, and, and the migration crisis that we're seeing now off the coast of Libya, these are not problems with easy solutions. These are not problems with quick solutions. And so they're not maybe as attractive or as easy to explain as this guy is here, has an arrest warrant, what are we going to do? So, Anita, so I, Anita, besides the issue of Omar, uh, Omar Bashir, uh, if someone were to ask you, really, what would you think was the highlight, really, of the summit? 
What would you say? Right. Well, I think that would be obvious, Shaka. It was the dazzling, impressive, and, and beautiful presence of American movie star Angelina Jolie, who made a really frank and moving appeal to end gender violence around the world, especially in Africa. Um, I will say, actually, she was on a panel with a lot of distinguished women, including um, the Sierra Leonean uh, UN representative um, on, on women's, on, on this issue. And some of them made some really excellent points, but of course, we were all dazzled by her beauty and by the fact that she even bothered to come. So I would say that that was definitely the highlight. Yeah, the Sierra Leonean lady was perhaps uh, Mrs. Bangula. That's exactly who I was thinking of, yes. And she told some brutal stories about the way that women are treated, both in Africa and around the world. And they were just really, really devastating stories. And um, they were worth hearing. It was good that they were out there in that forum. What about, uh, what, about what you'd characterize as uh, uh, the low lights during the summit, Anita? I think you've already brought that up, Shaka. I mean, quite obviously, to our audience and also to those of us who are, who are covering it, it was this tension over Omar al-Bashir's presence. It was frankly awkward. I mean, we, we had journalists running around the building trying to find out where he was at any given moment because we weren't sure if he was going to stay in South Africa or fly away. So it what was about, like a uh, constant Omar al -Bashir. What about the issue of um, Zimbabwean President uh, Robert Gabriel Mugabe being the chairman of the 25th African Union Summit? Uh, there is a lot, of, of course, uh, of criticism and opposition to him, especially against uh, him from the West. Uh, but it looks like uh, he's also loved a lot by people on the continent. Did you notice that? Right. Well, as you know, the, the reputation that Robert Mugabe enjoys in this part of the Right. Well, he's seen very differently in, in some parts of this continent. I think it's really worth remembering that he was jailed for 11 years. He was a liberation fighter. He's the first post-independence leader of Zimbabwe, and he stood up to a powerful force. That's the British. And so it does make sense that a lot of people see him, especially other African leaders, as, as a, you know, a, a first among equals, as, as a leader, as a visionary. And I think he does enjoy that reputation. As for the fact that he is the AU chairman, it, it can get interesting sometimes, because as you know, sometimes his positions on AU issues differ from the AU's official position. Um, he wasn't really clear on what he thought about Burundi, but he didn't seem to think it was a big deal, whereas the AU's position on presidents running for third terms or changing the Constitution to run for third terms is very clear. They're against it, whereas Mugabe is, is not, um, or it's really not clear. So there is that, that sort of disconnect. But otherwise, um, you know, I, I don't think we can deny that he is thoroughly African, and he is whether some people like him or not, a voice worth, uh, worth at least listening to, I think, well, on this continent. Thank you very much, Anita, for that report. Thank you. To learn more about the summit, uh, we are joined by Elastas Mwencha, the Deputy Chairperson for the AU Commission. Good evening, Mr. Mwencha. <laughs> Mr. Mwencha, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome, sir. How have you been? Very well, and how have you been? How would you uh, characterize uh, the AU summit uh, from your vantage point? Well, first of all, this is a regular summit. Uh, but this summit, of course, like another summit, had a specific and, uh, items that were discussed and also uh, reviewed a lot of programs that are going on in the African Union and also agreed on the way forward. Perhaps to start with, I should tell you that the, the summit looked at you know, issues of development, particularly what is uh, in the <laughs> Uh, the summit also considered the issues of migration and how we should address really the triggers and the challenges that face our young men and women that are drowning in the Mediterranean. The summit looked at peace and security issues, 
the summit also looked at uh, global issues. Uh, as you know, that at the General Assembly this year, they will be adopting uh, the, the, the new goals on post-2015 development agenda, under which there will also be sustainable development goals. And as you know, the African Union has also drafted, which is very much in line with sustainable development goals. It's agenda 23. And so out of that, the summit has also developed first 10 years of implementation and the full of uh, uh, also uh, discussions, but also implementation activities and the way forward. I'm afraid that uh, we're experiencing some difficulties with uh, the line, but uh, you mentioned something very important, and that is uh, the migrations, especially the Africans trying to cross uh, the Mediterranean, going to Europe. What specific uh, resolutions do you, did you come with uh, in order to figure out, frankly, how to stop the forces that push? Yes. Uh, the key area is, first of all, to look at how to create an environment that creates jobs, that gives space, especially for the young people to participate in economic and also development. <laughs> because if you look at the young men and the women that are living in the continent, there is a lot of criminal element in it. Those that come and paint a very good picture and give them young people false hopes. But then a lot of them end up dying even as they cross the Sahara before they even reach the Mediterranean. But we also looked at issues of the poor factors um, and also issues of human rights. But once these, uh, you know, people have been cheated and they are in the sh on the shows, they should be treated with the dignity, with humanitarian issues, and, and that we should, as a first step, create a mechanism for giving good information at a good standing so that we don't see these young men and women living in draws as they do. I see. Final question. What about the more important issue of women empowerment? What did you resolve? So the line is not so clear. Could you come again, please, Shaka? I was, I was talking about, um, did you resolve anything in particular in as far as regards, uh, in as far as uh, the issue on the agenda, the important issue of women empowerment? Yes, that was the theme of the summit. And with regards to women empowerment, uh, the summit agreed to develop a scorecard that looks at various elements. Yes. And the skills, which is really the tool that would enable women to participate gainfully, economically, but also be empowered. Secondly, how the women should also access resources like land, like capital, uh, but also how governance should also involve women, appointment of women in political uh, positions, but also in management positions. So it was quite extensive in that area. But the key element is coming up with a scorecard that should be enable countries to look at how they are performing in the various terms as far as women integration, women empowerment is concerned. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mwencha. Let's stop right there. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Elastas Mwencha, the Deputy Chairperson for the African Union Commission, for sharing his perspective of the summit with us today. Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking site website Twitter. And we are tweeting live 
followers at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka. And join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOAAU Summit. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with the other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. The African Union was first envisioned at a 1999 summit in Libya. It later replaced the Organization of African Unity, which was created in 1963. The AU Constitution was entered into force in May 2001, and the group was formally established in July 2002. The African Union is a partnership between governments and all segments of African civil society, particularly women, youth, and the private sector. The African body has 54 member states and its newest member is South Sudan, which became independent on July 2011. The only African state that is not a member is Morocco. <laughs> I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gidiru Ewert, and welcome Welcome back, and today we are talking about the significance of the African Union Summit held in Johannesburg. Our distinguished guests are Rosemary Seguero, founder and chief executive of Hope for Tomorrow, an international non-government organization founded in 2008. Its goal is to provide education and advocacy support for human rights, women's rights, and the prevention of conflict and violence. And the Reverend Dr. Isaac Mwase, founding president of the Friends of Baptist in Zimbabwe, a non-profit organization founded in 2002. Its mission is to support Baptists and the disadvantaged among the people of Zimbabwe as they deal with the economic challenges. He previously served as a professor of bioethics and philosophy at Tuskegee University in Alabama. Well, I have to say once again, uh, Rosemary and Isaac, that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Thank you. You're it's most a, welcome. It's a pleasure to join you. How does it feel to be on Straight Talk Africa? <laughs> it's fine. It's yeah. talking about African issues. And African issues. And I know that uh, you have obviously been very, very assertive, uh, especially with issues dealing with women's rights. I remember you were, in fact, uh, taking on uh, the chairperson of the African Union Commission herself, Dramini, Dr. Dramini Zuma. Yeah. And you seem to have reached an understanding of sorts that we are supposed to be working together. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So you're working together now? No, we are not working together. We, mm -hmm. We're still waiting and uh, looking at the meeting in South Africa. They talked about women empowerment. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we hope, uh, in, as you know, African women are very powerful and African women are the backbone of the families and the communities. So I believe if women are empowered from right from the rural areas mm -hmm. up to the high level, that would be very important. We want to look at uh, inclusion, all women. In fact, I was looking at some World Bank studies and uh, other uh, academic studies which suggest that uh, when you look at uh, women uh, as a market, for example, uh, they actually rank the third in the world after China and India. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, society doesn't frankly seem to give them the kind of attention that uh, they deserve. What do you think about uh, the proceedings uh, that went on in Johannesburg, the state of gold? 
the proceedings that went on in Johannesburg, they talked more of uh, women and financial tools. Uh, I think women being empowered in the uh, in uh, in Africa, getting resources to help themselves, mm -hmm. but uh, I did, and, and getting into politics and uh, being on the table. But we want all women, mm. right from because my focus is right in the rural areas. We want all women to be included, uh, and that's why we focus on uh, uh, training and uh, education with that and then we give them the actual tools which is financial after mm -hmm. they are trained mm -hmm. and then uh, looking at vocational training we train them and then when you give them the train the money the african women know what to do they are women who have lived on the farm they are women who know what they are doing it's only a push and that small push is alternative what do we do to these women? What can we give them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, what about the idea by uh, the chairman, uh, the chairperson, in fact, of the African Commission, Dr. Nkoza Sama Nkozu Zana Dramini Zuma, uh, who has talked about uh, launching the mechanized uh, uh, handheld teal and actually announced that uh, the handheld hole the traditional hall that all of us have known and perhaps have used mm -hmm. should in fact be discarded to the museum. The hall that supports the average peasant African woman farmer. So they wanted to take it to the... So to the museum because the, uh, they need to tap into modern technology. Modern, modern technology. Yeah, so that you can make uh, the woman uh, peasant farmer uh, more productive. Um, Mr. Sheka, as I have said and I have told you, the African women just have the know they just need that support. Taking a hoe and giving them alternative, that would be good. And the alternative is uh, financial resources, uh, electronics, uh, my machineries of farming. Mm. And uh, at the end of the day, they'll need education for all that, even in financial uh, education, uh, the farming, the machineries. You know, as I say, African women don't need that. They just need a push. So even giving, taking the horse from them, we hope between now, we want to help women now. We want to empower women now. So women need empowerment and they need support. That's why I focus in the rural areas, looking at the really actual women, where the farmers are. Farmers are in the rural area. So if these women are supported uh, financially, machinery, even if there's new technology, which is enter up at education, so we just want all women empowered. It's very interesting, of course, that uh, you mention rural women. Uh, there has been some criticism that uh, African women who go to school, go to universities, get degrees and uh, get uh, very uh, professional positions, in, you know, both locally and internationally, sometimes tend to be very elitist. They tend to be elitist and pretty much... Uh, uh, there is a sort of disconnect, critics say, yes. between them and the rural woman that you are talking about. Yes. Uh, is that your experience from uh, what you have been doing? Uh, I came, I was born uh, in Kenya, in the rural area. Where specifically? In, in Kenya? Western Kenya, Kakamega. And Kakamega, you know, a very beautiful place yes. uh, by Mount Eregon. I was born in Kakamega. Mm -hmm. I've grew up on the farm. My mother is still on the farm, doing what she used to do, potatoes, cassava, mm -hmm. and everything, keeping chicken. So all these and is, bananas and, bana yeah. and bananas, you can <laughs> never get them out of them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you talk about going to do research for women who have lived on the on the farm and here you're trying to say we empower them, how are we empowering them? So many people have intended, even investors don't think there's something in the rural area. That's why I'm focusing more on rural area and on agriculture that they know very well more than anything else. Very interesting, Rosemary. Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. We have to go and come back to you later. You're tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. and We'll have more of our discussion in a moment. But first, here is Mariama Jalo. Take it away, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the very passionate feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week. In our letter of the week, liberator Edgar Ogutu from Nairobi in Kenya writes, As a young African, I feel disappointed by the representatives of the African Union who have for many years played the role of a protectorate. 
The AU continues its engagement with corrupt and imputative presidents while ignoring the progressive social and youth movements that carry the agenda of the majority. Where is my voice? He asked. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui Ewart, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, coming to you live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. The African Union Summit ended Tuesday in Johannesburg with its members pledging to fulfill Agenda 2063, a blueprint for future development of the continent. The two-day gathering was somewhat overshadowed by the International Criminal Court's attempt to arrest Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir. Some say that the AU's primary agenda, centering on women's empowerment, the continental free trade proposal, and finding new funding for AU operations, found little traction. Well, this leads us to our question of the week, asking how successful was the AU summit in addressing the issues that are important to you? Well, before I dive into your responses, let me first say thanks for using all our social media platform to send in your thoughts. So let's begin uh, with a comment from Ojuka Obote from Tororo in uh, Uganda who writes, the AU should not only be against military takeovers, it should be against all forms of non-democratic tendencies, such as constitutional amendments to extend presidential terms, oppression, corruption, and human rights abuses. Well, another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOAAU Summit. And if you haven't yet, please follow us at VOA Shaka. Let's go to a tweet uh, right now from uh, Collins Epson uh, from right here in the United States who writes, the African Union is not effective in any form in Africa. Boko Haram is still growing strong, killing the innocent every day. That's what he writes. We are going to look at another tweet, this time from uh, Bubakar Njai, and he doesn't say where he's from, but uh, I think he might be from the Gambia. He says, I believe the AU had to work harder to fight for unity throughout the continent by strengthening government ties among countries. Well, Shaka, lots of thoughts. Your take on these ones. Very interesting. <laughs> what about uh, Isaac, uh, the good reverend, your yes. reaction to that? It's good to find that people are engaged in following what their leaders are doing because leadership is very important. Mm -hmm. The tone is set by the objectives that leaders embrace. So we've got to listen very closely to what they are saying and also look at what they are doing. Now, if you look at the declarations coming out of African leadership, the declarations make good reading, but a lot of uh, those who follow what African leaders are doing, they find that there is a gap between proclamation and the reality in their lives. So do you agree with some observers who say that uh African leaders at such summits, frankly, tend to talk the talk without perhaps walking the talk? Well, I might be inclined, inclined to agree with them, but it has been the case for leaders that action follows declaration. Yes. For the African leaders, we, 
they are at a stage in which they are trying to get their articulation right. Yes. As they get their articulation right, there has to be enough pressure on them internally in determining the fate of the future of their countries and their populations so that the gap between proclamation and implementation is narrowed. If you look at history, you're going to find that it takes a while mm. in order for society to experience changes. Well, change, it, of course, uh, is a process. Exactly. Not an incident or an event. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, I find that it is encouraging that the leaders are still expressing aspirations that have been dear to Africans okay. for a long time. Thank you. Well, Mariema, do you have any more feedback to share with the audience, please? Yes, indeed, Shaka. We'll move on to a posting from Prosper Atit Sogbui uh, from Accra in Ghana, who writes that the African Union is not effective because of the subgroupings we have in Africa until we realize this and close down all the groupings so that the AU can function strongly, we'll keep seeing our people getting killed. The organization can't do anything to clamp down on terrorism. The youth of Africa are calling on the leaders of Africa to sit up and do what is right. Stop the infighting. We need peace, unity, and love in Africa. God help us all. Well, that's a posting from Prosper. Uh, let's take a look at another Facebook comment, uh, this time from Okwondu Obina uh, in uh, Bani Walid in Libya, who writes, the AU hasn't done anything, and I am seriously disappointed in them, period. Well, Shaka, and guess that's a pretty strong statement, short, but very strong. Your take on these ones. Very interesting, indeed. Uh, your reaction, uh, Rosemary, to that? Uh, the AU hasn't done anything? Sure, it has done a lot of things. A lot of good things. Uh, for example, I can say for sure that uh, they have this position that uh, they do not recognize military coups anymore. Mm -hmm. And they don't. Yeah. They have actually, when you come to that, they have walked the walk. Shouldn't they, perhaps, as Obote from Uganda earlier suggested, that maybe they should go uh, even further, make sure that they take stands at uh, situations, frankly, that they deem to be undemocratic. Rigged elections, for example. Uh, presidents who are sworn into power to defend, protect, and preserve a constitution, but they turn around and amend it for their personal and political interests. Should the, the AU, in fact, take a stand that is the moral equivalent of a military coup? Your reaction? Uh, Mr. Shaka. Uh, what you're saying, uh, my, my organization wrote uh, an executive summary to President Obama at the African Union, mm -hmm. which was peace and stability in Africa, and then empowerment of women, and then... Um, what do you mean you wrote to President Obama at the African Union? At the, at the, at the African U.S. Summit oh, last year. The, the U.S. At the, uh, Africa Leadership uh, Summit. Lead, ah, leadership okay. Summit. Last year, yes. Looking at what is being talked uh, with the young people here. Looking at stability. We've, unless we have peace and stability in Africa, which we need, they need to be talking about because uh, we have young people, we have young people who are actors of violence. And this is where the young people are victims because even if the leader said we continue, the, the other people don't come, the young people who want peace, stability and leadership. So what we should look at and what the African Union should be, African uh, uh, Union should be looking at is peace and stability. Looking at Boko Haram, al Shabaab, you saw what happened in Kenya. All that you don't get to a country and get uh, what is happening in South Sudan, Burundi. If we get countries in order with stability, which we don't see them and talk so much, there is ongoing in Burundi, South Sudan, everywhere in Africa. So I think they should look at peace and security and looking at how to empower these young, young people who are the really actors. And you hear them say, nobody is giving them attention. That's why I say it in my what I'm saying, that let them keep, be given 
in support uh, understood to discuss things with the leaders. What they are doing online mm. is very, very important because that's what we need and what the leaders need to be talking about and not about this ICC. We need to look at uh, these young people and the women and see how the development will go. I think uh, that um, young people were left out into the discussion. But someone might say, uh, Rosemary, wait a minute, uh, they should perhaps also talk about the ICC because after all, no one forced the African founding signatories to sign the Rome Statute of 2002. They signed it precisely because they knew it could add some value. And it has been good for African leaders so long as it went after their political opponents or their rebels. The problem arose when it came to target presidents who are in power. It was like fire had come in the bedroom. Mm. That's really the problem. We'll come back to that. Thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, I think that will do it for today's social media segment. Uh, thanks to our guests for weighing in. Uh, just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. If you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Just sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, should African leaders have term limits? Many appear reluctant to relinquish power when their terms are nearing an end. That and more next week right here on Straight Talk Africa. A reminder that uh, you're tuned into Straight Talk Africa. And to participate in our program, please call us at 202-6193-111. Your country code is one. Well, you heard it all, of course, uh, and I'm sure that uh, the Reverend uh, Isaac Mwase, you're ready to jump in. Uh, yes, sir. Um, there was one response that said that the African Union is not doing anything. It shows that somebody really hasn't been following mm -hmm. what the African Union has been doing. If right. you go on the website of the African Union, you're going to find that uh, it is setting up the mechanisms that the continent needs mm -hmm. in order to be able to address the challenges that the continent has been facing. And African heads of state are seeking to act as a team, mm. in concert, mm. to be able to address those uh, challenges. Because they recognize that individually, they are not going to be able to handle that. But together, they are going to be able to make the continent a factor in the global dynamic. So, you know, you mentioned about uh, the... The, the issue about... Uh, Military coups. No, about uh, President Omar al-Bashir. Al-Bashir, yes. Participation in the AU. Th these are African heads of state that are recognizing that we are dealing with an international community that wants to set the agenda for African leaders. When African leaders are saying that we are going to set our own agenda. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the ICC, if countries that are not even signatures are trying to put pressure on African governments to do what they themselves are not willing to do for themselves. For example, can you name names? I'm not going to name any names. Why I think don't you people, say the United States, for example? I think people can be able to, to understand the position that African leaders might... I, I, no, I'm, I think that, I'm an uh, academic who just I think that, follows uh, these if you have the facts, If you have the facts, you should put them on the table. That is why we are right here on this platform. Yeah. So, 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 to empower people exactly. with information. Indeed. So African heads of state are going to say, if you look at the operations of the ICC, the, op the ICC has targeted 
none but African leaders. And, and so the African heads of state have circled right. wagons in, it, it, while they are also trying to deal. Now, I'm not saying that it's right yeah, or but wrong. I, like, when you look at the nine cases, frankly, at the ICC, at yes. the Hague, six of them were referred to the Hague by African leaders themselves. <laughs> by African leaders themselves. It, and then the Kenyan case was referred there precisely because the Kenyan parliament failed to deal with the issue. And then you have the two others which have been referred there by the UN Security Council, uh, in particular Sudan and Libya. Yeah, you have to understand, you have to look at what the African heads of state are actually doing. It's one thing to refer, to start a process. It's something else to make a decision and then to actually follow through with the decision. So mm -hmm. you look at what actually happened in South Africa at the 25th summit. It tells you that the African heads of state have made a decision. Combined sovereignty is going to strengthen their hand in dealing with the international community. Unfortunately, uh, there is no democracy in Studio 52. If the producer says you have to go for a break, you have to go. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. Participate in our discussion. Please call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. There are four major organs of the African Union. Number one, Assembly, which is the supreme organ of the AU and is composed of heads of state and governments or their representatives. It meets at least once a year to monitor the group's priorities and policies. A two-thirds majority is needed to pass a resolution. A simple majority can pass a procedural matter. Number two, the Executive Council, which consists of ministers of foreign affairs and meets at least twice a year. It primarily determines the issues that are submitted to the Assembly and monitors implementations of initiatives. Number three, the Pan-African Parliament, which has consultative and advisory powers only, but with the aim of ultimately evolving into an institution with full legislative powers. Finally, the Commission. It's the permanent secretariat of the Union, comprised of a chairperson, a deputy, and eight commissioners. They are responsible for peace and security, political affairs, infrastructure, technology, and agriculture. The Commission reports to the Executive Council. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidiu Ewart, and of course, this is Straight Talk Africa, coming to you live from Washington. Let's go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Good evening, Samuel from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, Shaka Sari. How are you? I am hugely terrific. Uh, do I still need a visa, by the way, uh, to access Kavari, the town where I come from, in southwestern Uganda? No. No, you are free to come without a visa. I'm around, I'll let you come. Around the Ruti area? I'm around the Ruti area, you are free to come. Thank you. What, is your, is, what is your question? My, my question goes to Rosemary, Madam Rosemary. How can African Union help 
and compare the European Union to check the influx of migration in the Mediterranean Sea. Did the proceedings in South Africa tackle correctly the affirmative action for women empowerment and democratic governance in African countries? Thank you, Shaka. Thank you very much. Uh, go for it, Rosemary. It was about the migration. Yes. The, the Mediterranean Sea. Mm. I think uh, what they should be talking about uh, now is uh, about transforming people and empowering people because people are fleeing in their countries because of uh, lack of jobs, because of poverty. And what they should be talking about, what can we do? What is the model that we can use to transform people instead of running to America, running to other countries? That's why many people have perished because of... Uh, poverty, they would better go out and save the rest of the families like, than staying home and then they get into poverty. That's why even if we have this terrorism and other things, because everybody's fleeing. So we want the African Union, they would have focused more on fighting poverty in Africa and this is where the migration is coming. People are not just running from their homes, it's all about poverty. The forces that push and the forces that pull. Yes. Earlier you touched on a very interesting point. You talked about uh, being born in Kakamega, yes, sir. on the foothills of Mount Elegon. Yeah. And uh, you talked about how very hardworking your parents were, raised you up with that hall. All of us pretty much were raised, frankly, uh, because of that hall. Yes. We have enormous resources. If you do your research, you will find that Africa is not a poor continent. It's not. On the contrary. It is one of the wealthiest continent on this planet Earth. What happened to our leaders? How come they don't have the values that are reflected in your parents and my parents? So that they can frankly do their job, their role of being leaders to their own people. We have resources. You talk about uh, the African Union. Yes, the African Union has the potential to do a lot of good things for Africa. But frankly, there are a lot of people who will say, you know what, it is a club, frankly, for the leaders, for the elite. It has no connection with the ordinary African person. As a matter of fact, when you go to the continent and you ask ordinary people, even on the streets, about African Union, not very many people, frankly, know what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about the African Union having the capacity, yes, does it have the will? Look at the building, the beautiful building in Addis Ababa, <laughs> with love from Beijing, yes. yeah. not from the African people. <laughs> no. Do you think the Chinese gave that building for nothing? For nothing. Yeah. Uh, the, more than 75% of the budget that runs the African Union comes from without to Africa. Yeah. There is a saying, my friend, that uh, whoever pays the piper yeah. calls the tune. You're right, Shaka, Th that uh, I there is a need for leaders in the African Union and Africans, African leaders at all levels of society to take matters into their own hands and to ensure that increasingly we have a sense of self-determination. The will among the leaders to act in ways that are going to advance the interests of the masses is a function of the engagement of those people. And it's not going to be one person here, one person there expressing dissatisfaction. Mm. Communities in the country have to be engaged in the political processes. Let's go to your country, Zimbabwe. Yes. You have had one leader. Yes. Since April 18, 1980. Yes. Correct? Yes. President Robert W. Mugabe right now is in his 36th year of ruling your country. Is yes. it because, as some people have suggested, that uh, he is an, a, is a very unique individual? He is. Very because, unique? Yes. He what is, makes him unique? He is the only one who has managed that feat. Now, the question is, given the fact that he has been in power all this time, how does the Zimbabwean community engage in ways that are going to ensure that the country participates in the aspirations that have been articulated by the AU in the in Vision 2064? 
uh, he, we in the diaspora here in the United States are beginning to take steps to get ourselves organized so that in nonpartisan ways we can serve to provide that voice of reason that says we want our leaders to act in the interests of everybody. Where? You know very well that some of our leaders in the corporations in Zimbabwe have failed their workers, they failed their communities. I mean, imagine somebody getting $300,000 a month who is the leader of a corporation with employees who don't have a salary. So maybe the that next, has to change. Maybe the next president of Zimbabwe could in fact be Dr. Grace Mugabe. Well, is she also unique, a very unique individual with unique skills? Let's go to the lifeline of the show and come back to you. Let's go to Adema from Tanzania. You're most welcome straight to talk Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Buana Shaka Sali. Unfortunately, I happen not to be a Buana. I am a Ndugu. <laughs> Ndugu Adema. <laughs> <laughs> Asante sana. Thank you very much, Ndugo Shakasari. Asante very, very. And, uh, Go for it. And uh, Mama Segero and the uh, Reverend. Now, I just want to contribute something. You have a minute. Oh, now, concerning Mama Segero's the suggestion of the African Union to help a common person. Go ahead. Uh, for for inform information, me, I am born from a place called Tororo. That's almost a, uh, one hour's drive to Kakamega. Uganda. And yeah, exactly. Near Maraba. Called Tororo in near Maraba. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Maraba, Malaba. Now, what Mama Tegero is talking about, uh, the African Union issue is the political. And the, the issues to solve military problems and the political issues, but the, the common person on the ground, the suffering child, a person who's HIV positive, the hungry child, most people in Africa even, the common person doesn't know even what African Union is. This is the issue of the certain class of people. And the Mama Tegero, for your inform information, right now as we talk in, in Kakamega, there are people who are sleeping hungry. Thank you. Over Th thank you, please. Uh, just give her, uh, give her an opportunity to respond to you, Adema, please. Could you please respond to her? You have about 30 seconds. My mic is not... You can't hear? I can't well, hear. Yeah, let, let's talk about... Uh, Grace, Dr. Grace Mugabe? Yes, I, I don't know who's going to be the next leader in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, what I know is that the Zimbabwean community has to be engaged uh, and has to participate in the process. For those of us who are here in the United States, our task is to ensure that our participation in the development of the country is in shaping those policies that will ensure uh, constructive engagement with the uh, and away, uh, unfortunately the, the good professor of philosophy time happens not to be our best ally on that note thanks to our distinguished guests Rosemary Segero founder and chief executive of hope for tomorrow and Reverend Dr. Isaac Mwase founding president of the friends of Baptist in Zimbabwe thanks to our field stations along with our viewers and listeners we thank you for tuning in for many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's a day break Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.